Welcome to the Mina Surge podcast, the ultimate source for all things Web3 and fintech related in the Mina region. Powered by Fintech Surge and Future Blockchain Summit, taking place at Dubai Harbor, October 15th through 18th, alongside Expand North Star and in association with Jitex Global. I'm happy to be joined by our partners today from Cointelegraph Mina. Cointelegraph is the leading Web3 publication covering all the latest trends in blockchain, Web3, and fintech for the region. Hi everyone, I'm here today with Jorge Carrasco from FTI Consulting who runs the blockchain and digital assets side of things in the MENA region. How did you get into blockchain to begin with, personally? Yeah, so I've worked all my life in, in technologies, recommending technologies to, to companies, and I've always been curious about new stuff that was coming up. So it was back in 2013-14 when I was reading a lot about uh, Bitcoin. I created a wallet, I started some mining in my laptop when that was uh, possible, right? No now, now with the rigs and all that, that doesn't make any <laughs> sense any longer. And uh, I, I parked that a little bit, but, uh, but in 2016-17, when all these ICOs started, uh, the, the hype again, Ethereum was already in place with the smart contracts, adding functionality to the, to the networks, etc. So I did some more courses, uh, keeping the interest on the, on the technology. And uh, a little bit after that, I thought it was uh, um, good to suggest to my company to explore the technology and, and, to, and to look into that. So we created like a position for that, which allowed me also professionally to, uh, to start doing this and, and meeting companies about this topic. And now oh, cool. it's my full-time job. Wow, what a journey. I mean, yeah. good for you for getting in so early and being a part of that movement. How different is the space now from when you started? Oh, a lot. So at the beginning, it was um, a space for just a few people that was interested in it, few forums, uh, very little amount of YouTube videos, etc. And now, uh, of course, you, you have uh, a, an army of YouTubers talking about that. You have, uh, you have like hundreds of companies where this is their bread and butter, working on different domains of the, of the technology, the, the different... Um, uh, distributed ledger technology approaches have evolved a lot. When I started, for example, Hyperledger was having Fabric and, and a couple of others. Now there is a whole bunch of, of, uh, of uh, frameworks over there, yeah. uh, multiple organizations. I mean, the events around the, the topic have, have boomed as well. I think I attended the first uh, Future Blockchain Summit uh, and, and, and now to see how it has evolved, yeah. the maturity, etc. So it's... Uh, it's uh, amazing to see how all this has evolved. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, uh, I got in in 2017 and the change from then to now has been drastic. Um, but I mean, I wish I got in earlier, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I think everyone does, though. But I feel like we're still quite early. Definitely. Yeah. So um, what about FTI Consulting? What do you guys do? How did this come about? Tell me all about it. Yeah, so FTI Consulting is an American consulting firm based in Washington. It was founded in 1982, so it's already 40, 41 years old. And uh, is uh, present all over the world, uh, has offices in 31 countries. And here in the Middle East, we are around 200 people working on, on different segments. So FTI Consulting has five major segments. So it has um, corporate finance uh, to help companies restructuring M&A, etc. It has economic consulting. It has also strategic communications, which takes care of public relations, investor relations, crisis communications for companies. It has a, as well a financial litigation consulting uh, piece, which uh, helps companies with the AML, CFT, uh, and these kind of policies. And it has the tech segment, which is how uh, you apply technology for what we call the moments of truth of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the companies, uh, periods of digital transformation, periods of um, assessment on, on new directions for, for the companies uh, in regarding technology. And this is where blockchain and digital assets uh, sit. So the, um, uh, the background of the company is uh, helping companies in in uh, moments of crisis. Actually, uh, FTI stands for Forensics Technology 
uh, incorporated. And uh, this is how blockchain digital, digital assets started as well. So when the, the hacks of Ethereum, the, the, the DAO uh, started at the beginning, the, the one that uh, split the Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, mm -hmm. so there were no companies out there to um, investigate or, or track and trace what happened. Mm -hmm. So the law firms that got involved there called FTI because FTI was already into the digital forensics and discovery and these kind of things. So that was the first time FTI did a deep investigation and in, in case in, in blockchain. Wow. Uh, so from there, the company realized that there was an opportunity that more of those things were, were going to happen, that mm -hmm. uh, the, there was a need for educate about the technology, to uh, do the right uh, implementation about the technology, making sure it was uh, secure, making sure there were no vulnerabilities in the smart contracts and things like that. And the unit started growing from there. Okay, so you mainly work with post-crisis or do you work before yeah. as well to prevent yeah, th it? Thanks for that, because, uh, for that question because we, we do a lot of stuff. So yeah. <laughs> uh, inside the blockchain data analysis, this is how it started, right? But then it evolved to, to, different, to different, it unfolded. So right now, we, uh, from, from that um, understanding of the technology, of course, we continue doing investigations and asset mm -hmm. tracing, etc. And, and, and um, especially in the US, that is a more litigation oriented uh, market, we do a lot of that. But because of that understanding of the technology, we started doing, for example, due diligence of uh, crypto projects and blockchain projects for big firms that were looking for investments, for VCs and family offices that were looking for these investments and uh, and uh, we do the due diligence for for those, those companies and the preparation for the for the startups also uh, because uh, part of that due diligence is understanding the regulatory risks mm -hmm. of these of these uh, companies so we are starting getting more and more into the regulatory frameworks to the point that today we support regulators worldwide on their uh, framing of the of the um, of the rules and the, and the regulations on them staying up to date on what is going on in the world, what other regulators are doing, how they should evolve the regulations, uh, on their monitoring and tracking of the, of the ecosystem, of course, to, to make sure that they will have ways to measure what is going on in case they need to enforce some of the, of the rules that they put in place. And that understanding reflects as well in our capability to support the companies when they are seeking regulation, when they are looking for a particular license, they will have to fulfill tons of requirements, tons of documents, policies, etc. And uh, we can help them not only from the blockchain digital assets point of view, but they will need uh, AML and CFT policy. We have a unit for that. They will need uh, cybersecurity and enterprise risk management policies. We have units for that. And they will need uh, data privacy or retention policies for the, for the records. And, and we have an information governance and data privacy uh, team mm -hmm. for that as well. And last but not least, uh, we understand very well about the blockchain technology, right? So we are uh, well positioned also to support, especially big corporations when they, when they have the need to uh, streamline, get efficiency on some of the, on, of the processes, the most well-known are supply chain, ESG, et cetera. We are able to um, frame a plan or a strategy for them to, to adopt these technologies, to transform some of these processes, to adapt, to digitally transform, to adopt the, the, the blockchain technology in the right way. Okay, really cool. And you mentioned that you work with uh, regulators on a global level as well. Um, what market are you most bullish on? Because a lot of, you know, we're seeing little crypto hubs across yeah. the world, uh, major cities, London and Prague for some reason, yeah. which is quite random, <laughs> Lisbon, um, Singapore, what, well, not Two so words. much anymore. Middle East. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in, in the Middle East is where the, the regulators are more open, more, more friendly. Also, the regulations are more mature. So, for example, Abu Dhabi issued the regulations in 2018. Now we have a comprehensive framework as well here in Dubai. Uh, so the, there is a solid base to, to work on, to, to review, to adapt, mm -hmm. to, uh, to monitor, to support companies that are looking for a regulation to, to set up their companies and their, and their operations in. 
other areas of the world, so in the case of the, of the US, so the, the regulation there is not there yet and, and, they, and they are deciding to take a, a, a different approach. So the support uh, for the companies uh, there is more about understanding the risk, understanding what other options are out there. In the case of Europe, they just released what the regulation is going to be, but the regulation is not there yet. So there is more about uh, letting companies understand what is coming and, and how they should uh, approach uh, that, that particular region. In the Middle East, it's about actually uh, how to set up operations and yeah. how to uh, put together the company in, in a compliant way with the regulation and to the regulator, uh, for the regulators to understand the challenges that, mm -hmm. that uh, the regulation um, uh, has with it and, and how to continue evolving and improving. In Asia, uh, Hong Kong, for example, has just uh, released uh, some, some uh, w what the regulation is going to be as well. So it's still in the early days, but the activity there is starting again. So different regions, different approaches, different ways we can support the ecosystem, the regulators and the, and the company. Okay, so the markets have been in turmoil for the last 18 months. What do you feel this uh, means for the future of the industry? Yeah, so it's true that a lot of things have happened in a very short period of time. So that somehow has uh, made a, a lot of people to sit and wait if that is the normal thing, if, if uh, things are going to change for the, for the better. Uh, so uh, from one side, it has um, uh, been a, a call for regulators to, to catch up and to, and to increase the, the scrutiny to understand what were the... The, the situations for, for those events to happen and to try to avoid them moving forward. And, and uh, that has allowed for the regulators to put together a much more comprehensive and, and uh, reliable framework for, to, to license companies. And also companies, I have seen a change in the way they approach this. Before, before uh, 2021, in 2020, I could say that it was a bit about uh, like the far west. So everybody was uh, doing, uh, announcing, uh, very, making very big announcements about, uh, about their projects, their, in some cases their returns, they were promising returns, um, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, unfulfilled promises uh, later. Now you see how companies are taking much more seriously the approach of, yes, I will be much more compliant. I will take care of the funds of, the, of my customers. I am giving proof of reserves. I mm -hmm. am segregating the funds. I am um, checking if the tokens that I am issuing are security tokens or utility tokens. So I see companies uh, asking for all these things to make sure that they are not entering into any blurry area. Yeah. Uh, so there is um, much more work with, uh, with the lawyers, with, uh, with the consultants like us, uh, helping companies to reassure that they are um, in, the, in the right way. And also sometimes a lot of consultations with the regulators, like this is not clear uh, mm -hmm. what, what we should do about it. So... I think it will be much more difficult to see uh, those events again, but uh, still people will find ways to, to uh, commit fraud, to do scams, etc. But if you look at the reports, the, the financial crime, the crypto crime reports that are uh, coming out, there are still some big hacks, but the number of hacks are uh, uh, diminishing. And also the percentage of, let's say, illicit transaction, transactions, transactions related with with fraud or, or crime is going smaller and smaller versus the overall amount of, of transactions. Okay, this is an interesting take. So you did mention proof of reserves and there's a huge debate around proof of reserves and liabilities. Um, I, I would like to hear your opinion on that a bit. Yeah, so um, crypto exchanges uh, saw a need to uh, communicate transparency and uh, they thought that proof of reserves was uh, a way to do it. So the first approaches, I think they were not well thought because uh, they were saying, okay, I've been audited, now my proof of reserves are like this. The, the problem of that is that the, the moment the next transaction happens, those proof of reserves are no longer valid. The situation has changed. 
A second approach was, okay, I uh, release a, a functionality. Any, anytime anybody can check my proof of research as they are right now. Mm-hmm. But still, that, that can have many implications in the backend, who is auditing, all, that, all how that is, is happening, etc. So the way um, regulators, I think they are approaching this, uh, this field is, okay, beyond showing this transparency, there are many other um, ways the company's structure, the company is operating, the, the way the, the, the journey of those funds is, is reported and communicated, etc. So there are many guardrails, there are many uh, um, things that are being put in place for those companies to stay within the, within the regulation, to stay within, to protecting the, the, the customer interest, which ultimately is the, is the main goal. And for customers to, to, to feel more safe in the way those, those exchanges are, are doing. But transparency is a very big thing. And also for these exchanges to be regulated somehow is also something be, uh, very well needed. Well, for the exchanges to be regulated, um, I feel like right now there's a lot of, as I mentioned, turmoil uh, in the space. I feel like regulations are constantly changing. So what advice would you give to exchanges looking to set up? Yeah, so uh, obviously exchanges, especially the decentralized ones, uh, the, they sit across many jurisdictions. The, the way the information is dealt with is, is not perfectly fitting into what the regulators traditionally have, uh, have been considering. So, uh, but, but still, uh, the regulators, especially in the digital assets, are becoming more open and uh, there are sandboxes out there for, for these uh, discussions to happen. So I invite the, all the exchanges to initiate those processes mm-hmm. and uh, to uh, initiate that open uh, discussion with the, with the regulators. Uh, the compliance teams, I know they are doing a lot of efforts to, to get regulated and to understand how they should be operating. And it's a, this is actually a help for them to, to understand if uh, they are managing uh, all that properly or there are considerations that they might not uh, uh, be taken care of. And you see that in smaller companies. So smaller companies, uh, startups, scale-ups, uh, when they do their business plan or, or their plans, they take care about the p they take care about the marketing, they take care about the operations. Uh, I see that the, still they are not taking care of uh, well enough on the regulatory side, on the compliance side. So when they approach these processes, uh, they, they suddenly find out that it's much more complex than they initially thought, that they need people inside the company to take care of, of all these things. So there is an entire segment of the company that needs to be considered from scratch and that uh, they need a lot of things to put in place to make sure that consumers are protected and that, and that they are properly regulated. So. For uh, companies to establish themselves in this current market, I know um, in 2021, it was quite easy. You know, you get a couple of influencers, you do the shells, you make these big promises. What do you feel users, the retail investors, should look out for? Um, uh, other than compliance, how, how can companies, because now everyone's claiming compliance, that's their unique yeah. selling point. But what can retail investors really look out for um, when you know getting involved in the space, yeah. So one thing is the, the all the regulators have public registries, so anybody can can go and check what is the regulatory status of of any exchange and uh, decide if if they want to go only with regulated ones, uh, which should give some confidence about mm-hmm. their operations, uh, or they or or they want to go to other approaches. Also, the track record is important, so. Um, what is the volume of transactions of that exchange? Have they been operating in other countries? For how long they have been operating? Uh, so, because there are many, many uh, exchanges out there uh, which you don't see the track record. Uh, it's important to see the team that is behind mm-hmm. that, if it's uh, people that have been working in the industry for a while, what is their background. So I would do all this due diligence if you decide to uh, put your money in, in, into different exchanges. It requires a lot of, a lot of due diligence and um, otherwise you might end up like uh, with, with surprises 
and, um, and do your own due diligence. Basically. How important would you say the team is? Um, what kind of weight does that role carry? It's very important. It, it needs to uh, be people that have been in the industry for a while, that have mm -hmm. a, a, probably a, a, a corporate background because uh, this whole industry, blockchain digital assets, is, is, uh, is at most, if you look at when the Bitcoin uh, paper was released, is at most 14 years old, right? So uh, a lot of people ha are coming from the corporate banking uh, industry, which is good because they understand how finance works and now um, uh, how all these new decentralized finance and new the and all these new um, ways of of providing exchange services, lending, borrowing, uh, payment and remittance and services need to sit on some of the experience that comes from the from the traditional world. Of course, it needs to provide all the advantages that come with the with the technology, but still uh, doing things in a in a certain structured way is something that that uh, these people can can bring. Awesome. And do you guys help companies get into that structure way as well? Definitely. So, um, and the, and the and the good thing is that most of the most of the people in in, in FTI they come from expertise in the industry. Mm -hmm. So when we sit with a, with a company to see how they are go they should be structured in the business depending on their activity that they want to conduct, we have people that have been there before. So uh, when we uh, recommend on corporate structures, when we recommend on operational uh, procedures, when we recommend on information privacy, etc. So we have people that have implemented this on companies uh, before. Um, so we, we support uh, the companies throughout this journey mm -hmm. uh, on different aspects and also when they go to the regulatory process, how they should prepare everything so that that regulatory process is as seamless as possible. Okay. And when companies come to your branch here in the Middle East, do you guys help them on a global level or is it just focused in the region? So uh, typically companies uh, approach for global level wherever their headquarters are. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have so many cases where you start working in one region and then because that applies to the whole company, you start working at a global level. And that's an advantage to be a global company that in the case of some exchanges, for example, you work on a compliance case or on a, or on a recommendation case mm -hmm. in the Middle East, but the same problem is popping up in other jurisdictions as well. So uh, the reference is set up there and, and we start supporting them at, at, at global level. So what is your view on crypto winter? Uh, crypto winter is, is something that um, it was uh, inevitable after all what happened. So the, the trust in the, in the crypto space uh, has uh, lowered down. That has made also investors to, to wait and see how things are unfolding. So there is a lot of cash waiting for good ideas, etc. The valuations of the companies have gone down as well. So uh, obviously with the hype, there were high valuations and, and many investors that didn't want to miss the train and they were committing funds for the different rounds of investment for these, uh, for these companies. Now, Companies uh, want to be much more uh, competitive, bring much more innovation that is creating, I think, better, more solid products out there. And uh, the, the investments are more conscious in the, mm -hmm. in the space. I think um, the, the coins or the, or the crypto schemes that didn't have value have, mm, uh, are, are slowly, slowly getting out of the, of the, public, uh, of the public domain. And uh, the, the ones that uh, have more value and, and where people uh, can, uh, after doing due diligence, can uh, trust on, on those schemes, uh, they are remaining. So mm -hmm. the crypto winter is slowly uh, finishing, coming to an end. And uh, I think now it's much more exciting, the, the, the stage we're entering in, where the projects are more solid the, uh, and, the, and the schemes are more, are more reliable and trustable. Okay, so what about for investors? Um, you guys do investor relations as well, right? Yeah. So wh where are you seeing the appetite uh, is with the investors? So the investors still have appetite actually uh, in, in private banking or, or uh, in, in, wealth, uh, in wealth funds. There are funds specific for, 
for crypto, for Web3, for even for things like NFTs and, and, and more exposure to, to digital assets, the, the, the trend is to have more scrutiny, to understand much more uh, how, that, uh, how, the, uh, how those investments would work. And in that, in that uh, space, we are supporting uh, due diligence processes. So for funds, family offices, uh, wealth funds, we are uh, supporting them on doing a proper due diligence, how the tokenomics of that company works, uh, what is the track record of the founding team, how that company is structured, how is the business model of, of, uh, of that particular company. So we do a comprehensive due diligence to position the, the investors on a much better uh, um, uh, starting point to invest in those, in those companies. Mm -hmm. Also, we support the companies to uh, make them more investable and to, for example, fill some gaps that, uh, that ultimately they help the company to be more solid and be more competitive. So how do you see companies and governments transforming towards blockchain adoption? Yeah, so the technology has reached a good stage of maturity. Uh, so the stage of POCs, minimum viable pros, etc., I think uh, is, is a bit over. Mm -hmm. uh, still is needed because especially companies and governments that want to approach this technology or implement this technology for the first time, they need to do some baby steps to get there. Probably it's not the best to really move entire processes to, to blockchain at once. Uh, but um, the technology itself has proven its value already, has proven its value to, uh, uh, to put uh, data in a trustable manner, to uh, streamline processes, eliminating information silos, to uh, streamline multi-party processes such as supply chain or, or uh, reconciliation of funds between different uh, groups and, and, their, and their providers and things like that. So also governments, they see in blockchain an opportunity to level up their smart city approach. Mm -hmm. So a smart city has multiple stakeholders need to deal with citizens' information, government entities' information, government funds, the, uh, the, the way the different departments interact with each other. So blockchain finds its way to support uh, these, these organizations, these governments on their uh, smart city level. And we see some cases, some opportunities, for example, in Saudi Arabia, where many cities are growing from, uh, from scratch, right? There, there, there are no old ancient cities like we find in Europe or in other places. That there are cities that are created. So they have an immense opportunity to reevaluate how they want to do things ground up and in the infrastructure layer, they don't need to uh, rely on old um, information structures or, or cloud approaches and things like that. They have the opportunity to rely on blockchain for, for certain processes. So it's exciting how they are thinking about, about this technology and, it's ex and, and I am looking forward to seeing how all these different approaches will, will come to a reality. So what industry do you feel is going to be most impacted by blockchain adoption? Yeah, so it's the same that has been more impacted so far is financial services. Uh, in financial services, we, we saw how at the very beginning they were like um, against the, the whole crypto and digital assets industry. They were thinking uh, that that will be just uh, uh, some years hype and then they, it will disappear. They have realized that it's here to stay. For um, very long, the same, the same financial institutions that were saying that, they were investing in the technology and testing in the technology and starting uh, seeing how the, the, the technology could support them on backend processes. So for example, international settlement and remittances between the different, their different branches or trade finance, how blockchain could be applied for trade finance. And we see a lot of consortiums ab about this and a lot of banking consortiums. Now, with the central banks uh, exploring central bank digital currencies, financial services institutions uh, see the need of uh, going through another round of innovation and, and understanding how they are going to adopt digital assets because it's no longer using blockchain just for backend processes. Now it's also putting digital assets uh, at, the, at the service of their retail customers. So we will see uh, at some point 
uh, accounts denominated in, in digital currencies, central uh, bank digital currencies or stable coins, or why not banks offering products where you can hold your uh, cryptocurrency uh, balances on, on, on custody from these traditional financial institutions because they provide trust, they provide uh, uh, confidence in the, in the end consumer. So for a more traditional consumer or for consumers that don't, don't want to think about where to put uh, these currencies, probably a financial institution, if they have the proper approach, would be a, a, a good place to, to put this. And, um, and, and financial institutions will have to think how to put a cryptocurrency wallet into their mobile applications, for example. They will have to think about how to offer returns based on staking uh, and, and things like that. So financial institutions uh, still, I think, is the, is the industry where we will see more innovations, more efforts, more investments and more transformation. How do you feel about DeFi? DeFi is a, uh, is a, great, uh, is a great example how things can be done uh, differently, mm -hmm. how you can do uh, things without the need of traditional players and other players can come up to serve the, the same needs. Now, DeFi uh, still uh, needs uh, regulation to make sure that that, um, that ecosystem can work in an homogeneous way and, and uh, DeFi protocols that are working all across the world, they find that the, the difficulties and, and challenges that they face in Southeast Asia are not the same that they are facing in Europe and are not the same that they are facing in US. So that's, that's where I believe that there will be international associations, international bodies that will come also to, to bring good practices for DeFi protocols before DeFi protocols really reach uh, mass adoption to, uh, to really provide uh, financial services to, to people. And in some cases, I think there will be a bridge between DeFi world and the and TradFi world to, uh, yeah. to serve the, the end consumer. So people argue then that's not decentralized finance. Right. So how do you feel about DeFi um, taking over the entire financial ecosystem? I think it's very difficult The we, we have, uh, I, I don't think it's impossible, but it's very difficult because uh, people still need uh, trust and confidence and in, in, in how their, their money is, is managed. And um, I'm not saying that a financial institution just by the fact of having there, uh, having been there for 100 years is better positioned to, to, to serve that. We've seen examples of big traditional banks that uh, slowly, slowly they were doing things in a wrong way and that uh, turned into, into bankruptcies and things like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, these are the most regulated entities and, and that is uh, bringing some mechanisms in place to do things in a, in a um, more reliable way. Now, decentralized finance has another challenge, which if it's fully decentralized and is sitting in many different jurisdictions, um, so they, they, they are ultimately companies, well, you have two approaches. You have fully, fully decentralized. There is no company behind that. I th the, the only best example I can think of is Bitcoin. So that is uh, working uh, across nodes all over the world and there is no entity behind that. That is difficult to regulate and, and it has value because it's a software running it and it, ha and it has reached that mass adoption that there are no single point of failure and things like that. Now, DeFi protocols, how decentralized they are because there are organizations and foundations behind them. There, is, uh, there are... Uh, working groups that are taking decisions on how that protocol evolves, right? So how decentralized is that? I, I would say not 100%. And uh, if it's not 100% and if there are uh, companies or entities behind that, those companies and entities will have to be subject to the regulation where they are sitting in. So it will be very difficult to uh, practically make it work in a sustainable uh, long-term way. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't think I have the, the answer if, if uh, that will conquer a specific area of activity or, or if it will displace how tra traditional finance is, is working. There are few challenges and, and, uh, and how decentralized and centralized these uh, really are is, is part of the equation, definitely. So now, a um, little rapid fire round. Uh, what do you feel is the next big trend in the industry? So I think um, in the in the Web three space, um, NFTs are a very exciting space. NFTs for different purposes, for different businesses to transform how they deal with consumers. So I would say we will see a lot of innovation coming from NFTs. That's actually really interesting. I haven't heard that answer yet. <laughs> um, and what are you most excited about at Future Blockchain Summit? Uh, the opportunity to network with uh, industry peers, to uh, have uh, meaningful discussions with uh, people wanting to innovate about blockchain, to use blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, the, the speaker lineup and the, and the panels to, to hear from, the, from industry leaders there and to have uh, networking and meaningful discussions over there. Awesome. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs entering the space? Look at what are the, their value proposition. Uh, rely on people that, mm -hmm. that have gone through that before and look into uh, the regulatory part of their business. They are uh, playing in a um, re regulated and unregulated space and it's very important for them to understand where the, where the risks are and what are the things that they need to put in place to avoid any challenges moving forward. Awesome. And lastly, what advice would you give to retail investors looking to get in? Yeah, the most important thing is to do your own due diligence. So look very well at the, at the companies you are dealing with, what is their track record, what is their trading volumes, what is their approach. If you see uh, very big returns, uh, question it, challenge it, and and uh, and that's my best advice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I think um, I have a mindful of information now on what to look out for. So really helpful. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank likewise. You. <laughs>